So today we will talk about uh, linear sketches and frequent uh, items. So towards that, I will first do a little bit of, uh, um, we'll revisit F2 estimation and introduce linear sketches. So if you recall, uh, when we wanted to do F2 estimation, uh, basically what we wanted to do in F2 estimation was that you were, you were string consisted of E1 to EM, where each EI is an integer in one to N, where we know N in advance. And the, what was the uh, frequency vector? Fi denotes the frequency of I or number of times I is seen in the string, right? And we were interested in F2, which were like summation of frequency squared in small space. And using generic MA sampling scheme, we saw this order root n long n space. And then we saw this very beautiful algorithm, uh, which was like order log n space algorithm. But of course, we have to multiply with uh, uh, your required order one over square, log one over delta, time log n, right, to get epsilon delta approximation. So what was that algorithm? That algorithm was basically, we were choosing a hash function uniformly at random from four by the independent hash family. And essentially, whenever an item came, right? So basically, we had this one variable Z, which we were storing. And to that Z, we, uh, we looked at, we just added plus or minus one based on what AJ was being hashed to from the function H, okay? So this is what was happening uh, in the algorithm. And then we noticed that, well, the, one of the better way to think of this algorithm is that we have n random variables that are four by independent and they take value in the range minus one and plus one. And whenever a new item came to the Z, we added this minus one or plus one based on what that item has to. And at the end, we outputted this Z square. Okay, so that was the uh, algorithm which was which we did. But if you notice that uh, that estimation algorithm, we noticed last time that it actually works even when FIs can be negative, right? And that led us to this following richer, richer model where rather than estimating this frequency moment, we want to estimate a function of some vector x in Rn which is initially assigned to be all zero vector. This is what happens in the frequency vector, if you notice, right? In the beginning, let's think of this, that you are given an n-dimensional vector, which are all zeros, okay? And uh, at any point of time, your stream is like a tuple, which tells you an index, and by the quantity, which you are going to make changes, okay? Uh, so, for example, you, you, you could be like, uh, for, it, it could be like i comma 10 or some i comma minus 5. It doesn't matter, right? So, our question went from F2, which was like summation i equal to 1 to n fi square, to basically given a vector, we were trying to compute some summation xi square, which is basically L2 norm. Right? Okay. So this is what uh, last time we saw that actually this algorithm is quite rich and this AMS algorithm actually works not only for the positive quantity, but it also works even when these XIs or the updates are negative. So, the, so as I said, the best way to think of them is that you're given initially a zero vector and each time I tell you an index and by amount I'm going to increment that index. Okay. Okay. So this is what we saw last time. And then we saw that if we now interpret our MS, like from F2 estimate, it became L2 estimate and uh, where streams are coming IJ delta Z and to the Z, you are just modifying Z plus delta J Y Z. So this delta J tells you that like, okay, fine. I mean, changes could be uh, negative, positive. So for example, you could have uh, like 2 comma 5 or maybe 10 comma 1.9 or 1 comma mi minus 5.2, whatever, right? These kind of changes. But what are you doing to Z is that you are, you are looking at the change times 
whatever the hash value of that guy is like for that index my h passes to 1 or minus 1 based on that you multiply with the sign right and you either add by the quantity or you subtract by the quantity right so that led us to rather vector x bar which is like x1 x2 xn and at the end we are returning summation xi square okay okay so this is what our aim is l2 estimate algorithm was so so it output estimates of x2 square where x is the vector at the end of streams of update because why mod x2 whole square because if it is a square whatever may be the quantity of x bar b right whatever may be the quantity even if it is negative square is positive right so uh, that wouldn't affect anything okay uh, so this is and then we saw that okay if you do analysis analysis remains the same and uh, like we, we did everything uh, last time and that led us to uh, that led us to this nice uh, algorithm for ms estimate okay that it not only estimates uh, what you call uh, not only it estimates just normal frequency vector but actually it is it gives us l2 norm of some n dimensional vector in x where uh, where the quantity could be both positive and negative and even then this algorithm works and this lets us to something which i just started at the last towards the end of my lecture sketch so what is a sketch 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 of a stream is basically a data structure okay it's a compact data structure okay zero okay such that looking at the sketch you should be able to output your function okay so whatever function you want to evaluate so this is not what you are going to return so this is like a uh, think of this that in a small memory you are you are storing some small set of information which is sufficient for your purposes for the function of sigma that you would like to output so what is my goal my goal is to output some function of my stream but rather than storing the whole function of sigma i'm going to store c sigma for example i'll give you just to give you an example of a sketch uh, suppose uh, like this is just like slightly away suppose my edges of my graph were coming in my stream okay then and I, all i wanted to do is to store a spanning uh, i i just wanted to answer whether my graph g is connected or not okay whether my graph g is connected or not okay then what data structure do i keep need to keep well i just need to keep spanning tree of graphs up until now see so i am not storing everything but whether graph is connected or not whether things two pairs are connected component or not by looking at this data structure which keeps my spanning tree of the graphs right is good enough so this i'm not saying this is but definitely this is just this is what i mean by when i say a small summary or small data structure so for connectivity purposes of the graph it is good enough that we keep a spanning tree of whatever graphs up until now you have seen okay okay so but there's a more beautiful property of uh, linear sketches what is that that they compose right what i mean by this that if you have a stream sigma one and if you have a stream uh, uh, sigma two okay uh, then uh, i can compute the so what do you call the, you can compute the a sketch of the comp, like this concatenation of sigma one sigma two by looking at c sigma one and c sigma two okay so looking at the sketch of this or data structure for sigma one data structure of sigma two i can come up with a data structure for uh for the whole stream okay or the concatenation let's ask what is the summary of algorithm for f2 estimation right is it a sketch right so what are you storing 
So suppose you have a sigma one, the only object which you're storing is Z one, suppose, right? That quantity, if you go back in F2 estimate algorithm, what are we storing, right? The only thing which we are storing in this algorithm is this quantity Z, right? And I'm claiming that this Z itself is a sketch. Okay, now sigma two, Z two, right? Now sigma one dot sigma two, I would like to say that Z is a good estimate. Okay, so for Z one, I return Z one square, Z two, I return Z two square, and here I want to return Z two square. Then can I say that this is a good sketch? Right? Look, but to compute Z1, you use the hash function H. If you are going to use the same hash function H, right? Then for sigma 1, sigma 2 with respect to H is nothing. I mean, like this is this concatenation is fine because you first ran sigma sigma 1, and whatever came, whatever came. Just let me take my scar. Okay, whatever, whatever H has function you are going to use, it doesn't matter. Like what was H doing anyway for every index, which is appearing in the stream, it was just doing plus minus and the deltas, right? So if I'm going to use the same has function, then with respect to that, Z will act as a, what do you call uh, estimate? So this Z one is a, sketch for me because they compose okay okay so a sketch is a linear sketch if it is basically summation of this c row one plus c row two okay now let's ask ourselves a question is a sketch of f2 estimation a linear sketch so well let's think of this slightly differently Okay, so now what was this y1, y2, what was y1 to y1 keeping anyway? Okay, so with respect to h, right, h1, suppose h, uh, basically we had this plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, and then this vector x bar, right? And this is what z bar was, right? What was, so it was basically a dot product of this object, right? Right. So first object, whatever may be the first index, right? Whatever happens, you are multiplying that with minus one. Whatever the second object comes in, you are multiplying that with plus one, so on and so forth, right? So if basically, if I think of this as a matrix M, then this is nothing but M X bar is your Z bar. Am I right? Any question here? Do you understand this is what is happening, right? So look, what is happening? Whenever an index i comes, right? What are, what are we doing? We were multiplying that index with the change and whatever the random variable takes the value for that, right? So once I have chosen my hash function, it is nothing but multiplying. We were, we were just storing this dot product. Okay. Okay. So another way of uh, thinking is this, that look, what were we doing? So this was one basic AMS sketch, right? Okay. Uh, but in general, what, uh, what, and why do I call this a linear sketch? Because look, if I think of this as a matrix, then M suppose I had X one bar, and x2 bar, then this is nothing but m x1 bar plus m x2 bar, right? It wouldn't change. So this is what I mean by this is sum. So it is a linear linear function. Look here, it was just addition, but it could be any linear combination. It does not need to be just additive function. It could be any linear function. Okay, okay. Uh, any question? Okay, so, 
so it's a so what is this technique of linear sketching so it's a general technique for sketching a high dimensional vector x in rn okay right uh and how do we how do we do it so you sketch by storing some pi x in memory for pi being some uh element of r m cross n where m is much much smaller than n okay so this is why i told you that f2 estimation is very much about also a dimension reduction right now i will tell you because if you just look at one you are just keeping one number so you have like for x bar this is what you would like to store which is an n dimensional vector by multiplying with one uh with multiplying with in our setting what is pi a pi is r 1 cross n for f2 like if you just use one has function then this is 1 cross n so m is much much smaller than the total dimension of the vector and you store pi x in memory of course and pi should have a succinct represent representation what i mean by this you we need to spend much much smaller uh we have to spend much much less than mn space to store but given i and j there is a low memory algorithm to compute pi ad right so for example look at look at here well i just need to store h what do i need to know i just need to store h if it is a four time uh, four by the independent random variable we are going to store some four number which is going to take order log n bits right now if i have to in i have to generate y i random variable what will i do well i will take this to the power 4 this power this and mod some arithmetic and then i have generated it so this is what it means that that uh, we need to like we need to have a low memory algorithm to compute pi i j given i comma j right so you you should be able to generate that item uh on the fly this is what it is trying to say in uh, in a uh, in other words okay so basically a sketch reduces the representation of x from n units of memory to some m units of memory where m is much much smaller than n okay so linear sketch is basically an algorithm in some sense for dimension reduction also okay and this technique is commonly used in the design of both streaming algorithm as well as distributed algorithm so the technique of linear sketching is not uh what do you call uh, it just not only uh, common in streaming algorithms but other models of algorithms where we need low memory of space right it is a useful way of doing things right example distributed algorithms okay now so as i told you right uh and this is very very huge full because if you go like if you go to things like deletion uh right and so then we actually do not know any other methodology at this point of time uh to do things okay what i mean by this is this is this uh so let me first tell you a different set of models okay so as i told you each element xj of stream is in the tuple ij delta j where ij is between 1 to n and delta i is some real value okay and this updates xij to delta j delta j can be positive or negative okay so there are there are different models okay so for example delta j's are always greater than 0 this is like a cache registered model and why it is called cache registered model because if you are in grocery store and like the guy always is positive he has never has negative okay so if the change is always greater than strictly greater than 0 then we call it cache registered model for example the model up until now we have seen for frequency we were just we were just telling you the index right which was same as saying index and you increase by 1 so that is delta j equal to 1 uh there is also a model delta j arbitrary but x greater than 0 at all times okay so 
I, as I told you, right, we start with all zero, 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 dot, dot, dot. And at any point of time, we say update this. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is called strict Turnstein model. And where do you see, for example, look at grass. So we would have started with, say, n choose two vector, length vector, which tells us that, okay, add this edge, add this edge. But, well, it's like you started with all zeros, which means that there is no edge. When you add plus one, it means you have added that edge. You say subtract minus one, it means you have removed that edge. So if you notice that delta j could be arbitrary, but this is a very good example of strict turnstile model. Okay. Uh, and there's something called turnstile model where you don't care. The vector x could be positive, negative. So this is the most general model, but this is also quite commonly seen, especially if you do graph streaming, then basically we are always talking about strict turnstile model. Even if you had a multi-edge, right? I mean, you, what do you mean of negative edge? There's nothing, no meaning of, there is no edge between two pairs of OTC. This is fine. But I mean, if you had multiple edges, you remove one by one, but you don't never go negative, right? It is at most zero. And there's a sliding window model. Like, I mean, there are sometimes the stream is infinitely, infinitely many, infinitely long. Like, I mean, look at a grocery shop guy. I mean, items are being sold, sold, sold. I mean, the guy cannot keep track of all the infinity. So he just keeps tracks of small window. We are only interested in computing function within the window of W. Okay, so this is called sliding window model, uh, but we will not talk too much about this in this course, but this is also an interesting model and there are lots of interesting papers written on this. Uh, so, so, these are the, so now whenever you see a paper in streaming, you can see these different models being discussed and you know what do they mean. Okay, any question? So indeed, if you notice that uh, we will, for now, we will focus on Turnstein model uh, where things will be all interesting. Okay. So now let's, let's a uh, little bit talk about models and linear streaming, right? Turnstein model, linear streaming, linear st streaming. So, so suppose you came XIJ plus Delta J. So XIJ plus Delta J, I mean, it is same as you look at your vector X, right? Right. And you have added. So think of this, this is your X, right? You have added EIJ is a IGF standard basis. What is the meaning of this? So this is zero everywhere. And at IGF coordinate, you have one, right? So basically this is same as saying that you have taken this vector X and you have multiplied with this vector. Okay, so I can also think of like that. This is the change which has happened to X. You will see in a minute why it is good to think in this line. Now, suppose Y was pi X, right? Now, what was Y was supposed to become? Now, Y is supposed to become pi X delta pi I J where, oh, sorry, this is a mistake. It should have been delta J. What is pi I J? Pi ij, think of this, that this matrix pi has n columns, first column, second column, third column, dot, 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 nth column. So basically what it is that you look at a pi x and you have taken the i jth column, sorry for this stupid notations column, and you have multiplied delta j to this. Okay. So this is what is happening. So you have taken whatever may be the value of pi x. Now you have added pi delta j, right? And so why this is true? Because as I told you, think of this, right? It is same as pi x plus doesn't matter where you write, right? Pi i j, right? And now you notice, right, that whenever new changes come, Look, you already have computed Y, right? So to compute, all you need is to compute this, this column, right? So, right? So what do you need to do? You need to do is that I need to generate this column, right? So if I can generate this column quickly, right? 
then like one by I, so how do I compute this column? Not, not, not one. Like I do not compute this column all at a time. I mean, I could also do that because this is the size of the column is any day M, which is supposed to be much, much smaller. So I can generate this and add Delta J to each of this quantity. Okay. And uh, so, and then add to X, right? So I take a dot product of the chain vector to this column, right? And then I add it back. Okay. So this is why, this is why this model is very interesting. And this is why it allows us to handle both positive as well as negative. Okay. Any question? Okay. So essentially it becomes what adding multiple of pi i j, which is easy in streaming, right? If we had a very succinct way of generating this column, okay, then uh, this is uh, easy in streaming. So uh, it's, a, it's a very natural question, uh, like people have been asking, is that like most of the algorithms which are which are known in turnstile model or a strict turnstile model turns out to be via linear sketching. So I mean, so the natural question was, is it true that that's the only way one can get uh, these examples or are there other things to do? And it happens that there was a paper by Lee, uh, Nguyen and Udrov, uh, which basically show that, uh, I mean, linear sketches are universal for turnstile streaming. So let me uh, say a few words about this. What does it mean? So basically what it tells us that of course, there's a bit of uh, caveat is that if you had any algorithm, any, any algorithm for turnstile streaming algorithm, any algorithm which takes S words, then I can actually come up with a matrix pi, which will have how many rows? Well, S log n rows. Okay. So just extra log n. And it will do the same job, right? It can compute the function which you are computing from this algorithm. So look, this is very strong in the following sense. It does not assume anything about that turnstile streaming algorithm. All it says that if you have an algorithm, then I can come up with a spy, right? Which has not too many more columns, sorry, rows, just S times login. So extra login factor will, will incur. But of course, I mean, these theorems comes up with uh, uh, some caveat, like, so the caveat is that we do not know how to construct this pi. I mean, is this, a, can, is it a low memory algorithm? Like, can we construct the entry of pi i j given i j in low memory algorithm? This theorem says nothing about these things, right? Uh, it just says that such a matrix exists. Okay, which can do the same job. Uh, okay, and also uh, there's, uh, there was another thing that suppose you, you had numbers from one to n, the size of the stream they assume is like doubly exponential or something. Okay, and then the natural question was that what happens? Uh, like, so this is why it appears that if you are interested in making a streaming algorithm in turn style model, then you better go and uh, look for some linear sketching because that seems to be the only way forward. Okay. But there are also some natural, uh, uh, natural streaming algorithm where M is not too large compared to the, in like too, uh, too large compared to the range, like one to N. Suppose what happens if you had poly n size, like suppose I gave you this precondition or I gave you this guarantee that my stream is like some poly n. Okay. Then there was a paper later, I do not remember the name, which showed that then you can do much better than uh, what linear sketching can do. Okay. So, but still, if you are, uh, if you are looking for in, and this also like n being poly n, it's quite natural restriction because if you look at the graph, like, I mean, number of vertices and number of edges are somehow correlated to each other in certain sense. So this is not completely unrealistic assumptions to make on streaming algorithm, but uh, nevertheless, 
uh, people prove that you can do much, much better than what the linear sketches can achieve. Okay, there was a later paper. I mean, I, I can send you the, I just saw in the morning today. So I can send you the link if you wish. So, but in general, if you're looking to make design turn style streaming algorithms uh, on, an, on any arbitrary input, then it is best for us that we look for uh, linear sketches to do this. Okay, any question? Yes, I get. So do we know an example where um, there is a non-linear sketches which is better than the linear one? I mean, yes, I, uh, but n like not for the general uh, streaming algorithm, but there are turnstile streaming algorithm. If you tell me the length of the stream is polynomial in n. So you, t you tell me that the numbers are coming from one to n. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but, but you, you also have told me that the length of the stream is bounded by some polynomial function in this range. No, no, what I mean is that, okay, even if we don't know the length, so we know that basically you can do everything with a linear one, but like other example where it's easier to build one which is non-linear compared to the linear one. Uh, for turnstile model, uh, I really do not know. I don't know. Okay, okay, okay. okay? I mean, I will check, but uh, as far as the expert says. Okay, so you are on, only linear one you've seen. Uh, uh, and... Uh, at least I listened to the lecture by Jelani Nelson okay. Okay, a few days back and the lecture was given a few days back and he says mm -hmm. that for arbitrary length, okay? Yeah. Okay. Only known, like only known streaming algorithm, all known streaming mm -hmm. algorithms, all. He used the okay. all. All, 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 all. I see, I see. So if you do not assume anything uh, more uh, about uh, like the length of the stream or something, like in an arbitrary setting, then almost all the known algorithms are by linear sketches. But I will still check back again and then come back and tell you the answer. Okay? Okay. Okay? Okay. Okay. So basically, so now if this is the language we plan to speak, okay, let's see how F2 estimation algorithm will look like. Okay? So now, uh, I fix L at C log one by delta epsilon square. Okay. Notice, right. And what I do, I construct M and L cross N matrix with entries in minus one to N such that rows are independent and in each row entries are four by independent. So how do you construct such a matrix M? Oh, that's very easy. So look, so dimension of, so now we are, not doing all this averaging trick, right? Taking media, nothing. We are just taking one matrix, okay? And we are doing a dimension reduction and we will output this vector Z, which is like, right? I mean, as a sketch, okay? This is a sketch, okay? And what is this? Basically what you do for each row, you may, you independently and uniformly at random choose four, one, two, HL. This is you. So you keep L different hash functions for each row. That's it. Right? So each HI, H1 to HL is chosen uniformly at random from four wise independent hash function. Right? Now, if I want to generate particular row, sorry, particular column, I will apply H1 to that entry and I will get that one. H2 to that entry, I will get the second, uh, second entry, so on and so forth. Okay. So this is how we can also look at F2 estimation as linear sketching. Okay. And Z is an L cross one vector in a slice to zero. So it's basically a dimension reduction, right? So what have I, what have I given you as an, uh, a sketch? Basically I have given you as a sketch, a uh, L times one vector. Do whatever you feel like with this. Okay. Now you can return me median, you can return me like any function of this. So this is what the sketch will be, right? So M is complex, compactly represented via L hash functions, one per, per row, independently chosen from four by the independent hash family, right? So this is how you generate this M, right? Like in lot of application, uh, uh, like in core sets and all, we generate this M 
uh, uh, this, we generate this M from some, some Gaussian, some normal, normals and things like that. This is not the only way to generate this M. Okay, we will see some applications and how is this connected to johnson lindstrom lemma? We will see that in maybe next to next week. Okay, but this is how the sketches looks like, right? So how do we construct this matrix M? Well, we, we get H1 to HL. L has functions, uniformly random for each of these uh, rows and that gives us the desired matrix M which we have been looking for. Okay. Okay, so this is just one example and your vector Z is your sketch. So what will we return? Z square. Think about it. This is a good question. Okay. So given this sketch, I leave this as a, a sketch. What do we return for L2 estimate? Okay. 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 So as I told you, right, sketching is like kind of shift in perspective, okay? And sketching ideas have many powerful applications in theory, both as well as in practice. In particular, linear sketches are very powerful because it allows one to handle negative entries and deletions. And what I mean by deletions, like, think of this like some numbers are coming and some numbers are going, and you still have to keep track of them, okay? And surprisingly, linear sketches are feasible in several settings and connected to dimension reduction, subspace embedding, and other important topics, okay? So those people who are only interested in graph algorithms, okay? Most graph algorithms are via linear sketches. Algorithms are via linear sketches, okay? Just as an appetizer, okay? As I told you, right, if edges are coming, E1, E2, dot, 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 EM, and all I wanted to know whether the graph is connected or not, okay? Then you could just keep spanning trees, right? It will take us n log n bits. But if suppose edges are inserted and deleted, okay? What can we do? What can we do? Right? And we will see that linear sketches helps us maintain connectivity in roughly same amount of bits. Okay? So, but for that, uh, we need to build a bit more. Okay? Okay. So now, in the second part of my uh, lecture today, I want to talk about frequent items. So I think since we will change uh, perspective. I think this is a good time to take five minutes break. Okay. We'll just, because like we will not talk about linear sketches or something. We'll just talk about something nice and simple in next half an hour. Okay. So what is FK when K equal to infinity? Right. So Fn, okay, uh, and uh, so what is Fk when k equal to infinity? So basically, f infinity is max i f i. Okay, so we are interested in most uh, maximum frequency, right? So which item f i has a maximum frequency? Okay. Unfortunately, F infinity is very brittle and hard to estimate with low memory, you know? So, it's because you can show very strong lower bounds for very weak relative approximation, okay? Uh, you, you know what is, like, do you understand why F infinity or the maximum frequency is very, uh, 
do you have any intuition why uh, it is uh, uh, very brittle to estimate so the reason is that look numbers are coming numbers are coming numbers are coming right and uh, like with just one change the fre maximum frequency element maximum frequent element will just change right so i mean you can make these arguments I, at some point of time i will make these arguments more formal then i will give you a real uh, lower bounds but but the what happens is that suppose n is very large like one is coming say m over 5 times two is coming m over 5 times like three is coming m over five times four is coming m over five times and say n is very large okay i mean for long you just don't know who will be my most frequent element so like this is what i meant that and suddenly at the at the end uh, so you might ended up storing all the n numbers because thinking oh this is occurring quite often this is occurring quite often okay and later just one extra one will come and make that element most frequent so in in general you cannot you can put, you you cannot have any multiplicative guarantee for this problem at all you cannot have uh, you cannot estimate maximum frequency at all in low memory okay so what do you do when you can't solve a problem what do we do when we, do, we when we can't solve a problem right you settle for weaker additive guarantees but what i mean by weaker additive guarantees is that well you just change the problem okay and this is where i say look i don't know how to get the most frequent item but let's say i want to find all items such that fi is strictly greater than m by k for some fixed k these are called heavy hitters or very frequent items okay like so if all the items are appearing very same number of times then there is no hope okay i like i cannot distinguish between uh, most frequent and almost but if someone uh, uh, really appears way more time than other people right or other items then maybe i should be able to find those so this is a this is what is called heavy hitters problem or most frequent items so in the literature any of these terms goes okay and again we will give a uh, additive guarantee we will say look i mean i will tell you if it is at least m by 2 times or some m by 4 times then i will i will be able to output those all those uh, elements okay uh, so let's first do uh, majority element problem so offline so given an array a list a of m integers is there an element that occurs more than m by 2 times in a right so in streaming is there an i such that if i is more than m by 2 so how will you do this problem in uh, say streaming sorry or for the for that matter in offline algorithm right so you want to i'm sure all of you have seen this uh, problem before right anybody i guess if you sample like a constant number of uh, of elements and then see if uh, if they i mean one element appear more than uh, half of the time here it should be it should be good So you want to do some sort of sampling? Yeah, no. Okay, but any other offline algorithm that you can think of, say deterministic, no randomization. Can I do median?
will median be good suppose i find a median of this a okay i find median of a okay can i say that this is the most frequent item or say or majority element yes don't i need to check look it's a median it's just a, a middle element right so you have to go back and check that this really occurs more than m over 2 times right so it's right you can we can do it in order m time for sure right uh okay but so and we know that there are very good algorithms for median okay so we can do this in order m time but suppose i wanted to do i wanted to find this majority element which is deterministic and in streaming how will i go about it so uh, can we do something like this like uh, so if i uh, so i know that the majority element will occur like more than uh, half of the time yes. times so if i get like two distinct elements then i will kind of cross them off and um, if we just repeat that process then um, like at least one of the majority element will be there like at the end okay so this is a uh, this is a very good idea and this is uh, essentially this is an idea which was by boyer more voting algorithm okay which i will tell you now so so initially c is zero okay and s is null okay so s is what is s storing s is storing my potential majority element okay this is what and what is c storing current count of my majority element okay okay so i look my i check if ev equal to s okay so my new element also in the stream is the one which i'm proposing as my potential majority element then what i say i go and increase my count at c else what happens i'm getting a some different element at that point of time that i look at the two condition is my count at zero if it is then what i say okay then maybe this is my potential majority element and i make c equal to 1 and s equal to az but if c is not equal to zero then i say well uh, i subtract c from c minus 1 what happens this point of time if you notice whatever s was storing right and ej is a kind of paired this is what uh, cyan was saying i have paired them and i have removed them in some sense okay okay so this is what is happening and while output s and c so we'll run this algorithm on a example in a minute okay and we will see what happens to s and c as as b run this algorithm okay okay so here is my example okay let's see what happens so suppose uh let's see let's see if i can draw e1 e2 so e1 is 5 e2 is 12 it will be helpful for us so let me draw E three is three, five twelve three, E four is five, E five is four, E six is five, E seven is five, E eight is ten, E nine is five. e10 is 5 okay okay so in the beginning let's see what was there so we had c 
and s okay so in the beginning c is zero right and s is null okay then what happens then uh, c becomes one and uh, s becomes five okay next e2 comes what happens then e2 comes then c becomes zero because new element has come right and there is always and my new proposal is s becomes 12 right okay and next element comes okay so next element when comes what happens let's see okay next comes 3 so c becomes 1 s becomes 3 right Am I doing correct? Then what happens? Five. No, no, I did something wrong. No, do you see where I made a mistake? Okay, here. This should have been five because I didn't change, right? Right? My potential candidate is still five, right? All we do in my algorithm, if you notice, that if I just change C to C minus one, but I never change the, my potential this thing. So this is where this is why it, it was confusing. Okay, so let's see what happens now. Okay, so let's do it correctly. So C becomes zero, S becomes five, and then next element I get is what three. So what happens at this point of time when I get three? Right? When I get three, C becomes one, S becomes three. Right? Because look, what is this? If C equal to zero, I make S equal to one and I make the current element as my potential object. Okay. Next comes four. Next comes five. So what happens when five comes? Well, my counter decreases again. C equals to zero but s remains 3 when this 5 has come okay now what happens now 4 comes i again go counter goes up c equals to 1 and s is my now potential object which is 4 okay now uh, e6 comes what will happen it will push it back again it will push back again c equal to 0 s equal to what is my new potential object 5 now next goes no no sagar i think it remains 4 yeah right it remains 4 sorry it remains 4 yes okay but the the moment e7 comes c becomes 1 and s becomes my new potential object becomes 5 Okay. And in the next step, C becomes zero, S remains five. That is now we are done with 10. Now again, five comes, what will happen? C will become one, S remains five because look at this algorithm, right? If E is equal to C, do C, C plus one, right? And we don't make any changes, right? And then 
again e10 comes what happens then this quantity will go here c will become 2 s will become 5 okay so this is what the algorithm is doing so as uh, san was saying what is actually happening look at the moment you decrease a counter you are basically pairing up your current element with something else distinct element so the moment right and so the moment you decrease c right this is what happens you you have found a distinct element to a pair of distinct element and you throw it out so the moment you go down again you have found a pair of distinct element you throw it out again you have got got a pair of distinct element you throw it out so on and so forth so essentially what is happening so what we will show in a minute that if there is a majority element i then algorithm output s equal to i and c is at least frequency minus n by 2 okay at least this much why let's okay but there is a caveat right algorithm may output incorrect element if no majority element right so you have to verify the correctness in the second pass right because all it is doing is that it's just pairing up two distinct elements and throwing up pairing up distinct elements and throwing up so basically what it is trying to implement is suppose you are removing two distinct elements from an array then it does not alter the majority item why let's see why so suppose i had a okay and uh, i had a and uh, okay a and suppose i have a item majority which occurs strictly more than a by two times okay now suppose i make different algorithm like a prime is nothing but a minus some two distinct elements x y what is x is not equal to y okay then what happens let's look at this uh, now number of times m appears in a prime is at least how much is at least how much we know that it appears at least a by two times in a and now among x y since x is not equal to y only one of them only one of them could be equal to m right so this right at least this is number of times m appears in a prime is at least this much but what is this this is nothing but a minus 2 by 2 which is equal to mod a prime by 2 so if so all i'm trying to tell you that when you remove this pair of elements okay then if someone remain someone if there was a majority element in a then that that guy remains a majority element in a prime okay you can make this as a very formal argument also but intuitively this is what is happening so at every time when you say look oh i have something stored and i have got some distinct element let's pick them as a pair remove them okay and this element is this algorithm is from 80s and uh, uh, this can run okay but it can give you a false positive in the sense that if the because if you run just only one pass then it can output you an algorithm output an element which may not be a majority element at all right so you need another pass to go through this stream to uh, check whether this is a majority element or not right and how will you check this you just check whether this element is equal to that or not and if it appears that many more time or not but if it but if the if the if the array had a majority element it will give you this okay okay so this is an intuition of this algorithm okay you can make this intuition as a formal argument either by induction or here is a very nice and sleek argument uh, which i saw so what people do for this proof which i personally found quite interesting is that uh, let's look at this okay so you make an auxiliary variable z okay and what is z doing z stores okay it's like a helper variable okay z contains counter value okay 
at any point of time if the current element ej is my majority element suppose m okay or it contains minus of the counter value if ej is not equal to m okay so which is a majority element here is 5 right is it like 1 2 3 4 5 6 yes 6 times it appears okay now let's see what happens now look at the look at z right each time you see m right you look at the like what happens to the z as we go right each times m appears z gets incremented by one at least okay and each time some other guy comes in okay so uh, any other guy comes in either it increments or it decrements by at most one right so think of this like as a uh, like another way of thinking is this like you have a, a, a push down automata okay the way to think is like a you have a stack okay so whenever 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 uh, z comes whenever m comes you are putting that in the stack whenever a different element comes you just pop out right that's it so this is exactly what this the role of z is doing so the number of times you will be popping out from this stack or push down automata or whatever you want to say is at most the number of distinct element number of elements which is not equal to m so more number of times you will be pushing in or you will be incrementing than you will be decrementing okay the reason i went into details because this is what we will formalize as we go forward okay so this is this is what is happening so okay any question is this algorithm clear okay okay so uh okay now this is something called misra grise algorithm which is from i think 1984 so it all it tries to find all items i such so that frequency of i is more than m over k okay so this is very much inspired from the previous algorithm now uh how many such items can be there find all items so that fi is more than so first question how many items can have fi strictly more than m over k host k great right yeah so minus is, one, right? yeah so at most hmm. k minus 1 actually so k is okay so what you do is that you associate an array d is an empty associated associative array while a stream is not empty what you do is that you look at the is ej is a current item right so i look at into my array d i check whether ej is one of the element i have stored or not okay uh if i have stored i go and increment its counter by plus 1 okay so if ej is a current item then i check is the number of items which i have stored is strictly less than k then i go and store the current item at its place okay i mean you can like you can implement this d in a various ways okay else what is the case else the case is when my item is not among these elements okay my array is full then what i do what did i do for two elements i said hey let's decrement this counter by one right now what i will do i will go and decrement all these counters by minus 1 right so uh taking the argument of sen forward what was he doing he was pairing up two distinct elements now at this point of time we have paired up k plus 1 distinct element right each 
distinct element and in some sense we have thrown this out okay we will prove that in that case also we are good inductively okay but so just let's just first understand this algorithm what is happening we have an array of size k at any point of time i check when my current item comes are you in this d if yes let me increase because these are my potential heavy hitters okay so then i increase its frequency by 1 if it is not if this element does not appear in this array and my array can accommodate one more then okay this is becomes my potential one of the frequent item i i look at this okay and if already my array is full uh, then i decrement all the counters which is there in this array by one okay and let me call f i hat as my estimate for the frequency okay so for each i in key, key keys of d i set f i hat as whatever the content of d i is and for each i which not in the keys i just set the estimate of f i hat to be zero okay so let's just run this algorithm one one example my previous example okay uh, so let's let's say it uh d1 d2 i mean i don't think this is the right way of to doing thing but maybe say 0 0 0 <laughs> <laughs> okay yes so suppose there is only one heavy hitter this yes. one element which appears m by k times and all other elements are different yeah it could be then it will be able to get that element i doubt that because if m is much greater than k square no it will it will get that but it will also get some uh, elements which you do not no want. it will it will get that it will get that but it will also get things which you do not want Yeah, because why I am saying suppose this frequent element, the first k elements are most frequent elements, m by k elements. Yes. Are same. I'll, pro I'll, I'll prove to you that every frequent element. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In a you minute, I'll prove yeah, to yeah. you every frequent element will appear, but it is not guaranteed that the element which are there, they are they are also like it's only one way. If you are most, if your frequency is at least strictly greater than m by k, then you will definitely be in the D. but it's not the case that if your frequency is less you may not appear in this thing like the way we cannot guarantee even for m by 2 that this will happen okay and there are examples for that okay so what will happen here uh, is that suppose uh, we want uh, uh d1 is 0 d2 is 0 and uh, what happens if so suppose uh i mean 5 comes uh is sakit what is the k you are looking for here what is the k i'm looking for let's yeah, say n by k right <laughs> yeah so let's say k equal to Three. Hmm. Then we should get which all elements? Five will definitely be there. Uh, are there any other element which occurs? Nothing else will come. So I suppose I am looking for uh, m by three, right? Okay. So so suppose uh, five comes, right? So I stored five. and i incremented so i mean i think this is the best better way of doing this is not this way okay i think let's let's me okay say 3 index for 3 4 5 uh 10 and 12 okay now at any point of time we will only fill three entries at any point of time okay Th only three will be filled so i see five right in the beginning everything is zero okay 
And you will see that in the process, at any point of time, uh, at most three, uh, 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 three index will be non-zero. Okay. So now I see five. What will I do? I get five. I go. Nothing is filled. So at the five, I go and increment the counter by one. Next, I see twelve. And since my k equal to three, I just increment because I mean this is not equal to five, and there's a place for it. Then the three comes. Well, there's a place for him, and then I increment one. Okay. Now comes the five, right? So what will he do? Oh, five already occurs. So I will do plus one. Yeah. Okay. Now four comes. What does four do? Now four, the already arranged fill, right? And four is not appearing here. So what will four do? At this point of time, four will go. And start erasing, erasing this. Start erasing this. So now again, this counter has become zero. This is one, and this counter has become zero. Okay. Now five comes. Five is already there, so it will do plus one. Another five comes. Again, it will do plus one. But now ten comes. Or oh, ten has a place to go. Ten is one. Okay. Again, five comes. Right. Did we do something correctly? Okay. And again, five comes. This one. Okay. Maybe let's do a. Slightly different example, and maybe it will it will tell us a little bit more. Uh, okay, so let's say we do, so this is how this algorithm is happening, and look uh, at this point of time, uh, you are also outputting ten, but ten does not appear frequently, right? So this algorithm can make a mistake, but five does appear several number of times, but so five is there in this array. But say let's do another example just for. Six, five, twelve, three, three, four, five, twelve, three, three, four, five, five, ten, three, five, five, ten, three. Okay, and see. Let's see what happens now. Uh, okay. So. Three, four, five, ten, twelve. But now, uh, when five comes, I go increment one because everything was zero in the beginning. Everything is zero. Okay, and then twelve comes, I make it one. Three comes, I make it one. Three comes, I add one. Four comes. Now, when four comes, you have to get rid of. Okay, let's say plus one. Let's say black, and I cut. Okay, this is what the roll of four did. Now five comes. What will happen to five? Well, it again goes in uh, and initialize one, and. Uh, Now another five comes, plus one. Uh, but when ten comes, uh, there's a place for him, so he puts where. And when three comes, here it is. So notice, at this point of time, uh, we have uh, three in our data structure. Three in our data structure, four in data structure, and five in data structure. So if we were looking for say more than m over Three or say, okay, uh, or say m over four, okay. Then which all element should be there? There are like nine by four, so two point two five. So three should be there, and five should be there, which is there, right? But ten should not be occurring, but ten is there, right? So you see, so this is a couple of examples which I have done for you, okay. Uh, any question in understanding the algorithm, right? I have just run this algorithm on these two examples. Okay. 
So what we are going to, so a space usually is order K, right? So what we are going to show to you is that this frequency F I hat is a uh, frequency F I hat for every I in A is at most F I, but it is at upper bounded by F I minus M divided by K plus one. Now notice why if this is this, then any item with F I more than M by K is in D at the end of the algorithm, right? Because what, what was this algorithm doing? If you notice, right? For each I in K is D, F I hat is D I. For each I not in K is D, set F I equal to zero, right? So, and I know if I told you that F I hat is at least this much. So now let's look at, Suppose some element appears m by k times, right? If I hat is at least m over k plus one times, right? If I hat is at least this. In fact, this is max of zero comma this, right? So what is this number? This is definitely greater than zero, right? What does it mean if it is greater than if I hat is greater than zero? It means it will appear in the array D, so you will output that. Okay, so uh, condition on the fact that if we can prove this lemma, we are good. Okay. So again, let's uh, let's go back to the proof of correctness and the what is int intuition? If you remove k plus one distinct elements from an array to get a prime, then all heavy hitters of a are heavy hitters of a prime if the array has one. Okay. So let's suppose. You had some element, uh, some element M, which appears mod A by K times. Now, what what is happening in A? What is what what is the number of times M appears in uh, A prime is same as mod A by K minus one, right? Is strictly greater than this, which is equal to mod a minus k divided by k right did I do something okay? Shouldn't. What did I define heavy hitters as? K plus one or K? I think uh, M by K. And how many distinct elements? Uh, okay, I think uh, D side should be uh, K minus one. Okay, D side should be K minus one because that is all that uh, we need. Yeah, see, sorry. See, here it is strictly less than k minus one, right? So this is wrong, okay? So we are actually removing k distinct elements, okay? Array, then what happens? This is, this is equal to size of a prime by k. So m is also is a heavy hitters in a prime, okay? So basically, you can make this an inductive argument, right? Oh, you remove this distinct elements, heavy hitters of this remains. So heavy hitters of A is a subset of heavy hitters of A prime. And now with induction, you can prove that, uh, by induction, you can prove that, well, A prime, so your algorithm outputs all the heavy hitters of A prime. So in particular, it outputs all the heavy hitters of A. So you're done, okay? But so you can make this also as an inductive proof, but has a very nice sleek proof by, I mean, you will end up doing the same thing if you do this, but this gives you an in intuition why these algorithms tends to be correct. Okay. So I'm going to prove that for each I in N, Fi by M by K plus one is this. Okay. To see why Fi hat is Fi, I mean, let's, you will see in a minute. 
So there's an, this is an alternating view of algorithm. This is what I was trying to do. Okay. So we are maintaining a counter CI for each I initialized to zero and only K are non-zero at any time. Okay. So what the algorithm does when new element AJ comes, if C EJ is greater than zero, then you increment C EJ by one. Else it's a, a, else if less than K positive counters, then you set, I mean, this should have been, uh, then you set C EJ equal to one only k minus one I mean, sorry about this uh, mistakes okay else you decrement all positive counters except exactly k minus one of them right right so in so if you look at this algorithm what does it does like in this case if the number of keys is strictly less than k minus one you decrement uh like if uh, for each L in K to decrement the counter by one. So this is exactly what is the view of the algorithm is at any point of time you are meant to think of this, that you have a N length counter and give corresponding to each item one to N and each F I hat is basically representing what the current current counter is representing. So things are moving around and so this is what we want to show that f i minus f i hat is m by k plus one. So look, which is same as saying that uh, what we wanted to show is this, right? Which is same as showing that f i is less than or equal to f i hat minus or f i hat is f i minus f i hat. Look, so what? What did you wanted to show is f i minus m by k plus one is less than or equal to f i hat. So you do minus m k plus one minus f i. It should be greater than or equal to f i hat. So if you take this others, right, plus. Right, because I multiplied with negative both sides. So what it gets f i minus f i hat is at least m over k plus one. This is all that we need to show. Okay, so this is why this inequality. So uh, first, let's call this is a special event. Okay, this is a special event. Uh, k counters being decremented, right? Suppose we have L occurrences of k counters being decremented, right? But notice, as I told you before, each time you pick up k distinct elements and you throw out, right? That implies that L k plus L is less than or equal to M, which implies that number of times this special event happens is M by k plus one. Okay, there is some plus one minus one somewhere. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I think uh, it should have been just m by k. Uh, it should not be m by k plus one. I mean, this is, I think, uh, sorry, I mean, there should be some plus one, minus one somewhere. Okay. So now I want to consider the following quantity alpha. Look, so what are we interested in? fi minus fi hat at the end. Okay. As items are process, uh, uh, processed. So, I mean, what I'm going to tell is not entirely correct because uh, what I would like to show to you is that like what I would like to say is alpha j f i j minus f i hat j. What is the meaning of this? Suppose I have seen the j stream like up to j stream, right? What is the difference between the real frequency like up to now how many times real frequency minus my estimate right and what are we interested in we are basically interested in at the end of them because then what is fij is fim which is same as fi right and fim hat is the estimate which we are going to return so basically if i have to do it really formally i should define something like alpha j like 
number of times I have seen my uh, item i up to the stream jth uh, in index. And what is this? My current estimate. Or the, what is the current estimate? The something which you are storing in the counter. OK. So but uh, for now, let's think that they are both same. OK. So if ej equal to i, so if the current element is i, what happens? And phi i is incremented. So look, so there are several cases, right? You have ej, right? Now, either this ej belongs to, uh, either ej belongs to the current stored item or not. Okay? Suppose it is, it belongs to the current stored item, then what happens? Ci will be incremented and alpha will stay the same because what happens? Up until now, whatever element you have seen, right? Fi, the real frequency, also increases by plus one, but the, because you're incrementing the counter, which is storing your current estimate of Fi hat, this also increases by one. So alpha, there's no change in alpha in this case. Now, if Ej is i and Ci is not incremented, what, when will this case happen? Can you tell me? Like my current element is i, but ci is not incremented. That can only happen. Then alpha must increase by a. Like, like ej is i and ci is not incremented. I mean, so ej is present in my counter and it is not incremented. It means some different element came. When some different element came, what happens? Everybody got decreased. So your number of, in this case, uh, oh, this is just, no, this is not wrong. This is wrong. Frequency remains the same, right? No, 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 this is correct. Right? So, what happens if ej is equal to i and ci is not incremented? When will this case happen? Right? It means look at the current set of stored elements, right? They are not equal to ej. Then what will ej do at this point of time? Right? And ej is not able to go in and ci is not incremented. It means it will decrease all these guys by one. But then what happened at this point of time? Right? Real frequency has increased by one, but its estimate does not increase at all. So your alpha will increase by one, but we will charge this to this special event, this L, right? Because at this point of time, we are going to decrease the L. Uh, okay. Next, suppose EJ is not equal to I and CI is not the counter that is non-zero, right? Then what happens? Like EJ is not equal to I and CI is not the counter that is non-zero. Then neither FI change nor FI had change, nothing happens. But suppose EJ is not equal to I and alpha increases by one. Why? Because some other element came, okay? And it decremented everybody. But at this point of time, frequency does not change it. But since your frequency had had changed, right? It has decreased at this point of time again alpha will increase by one but again you can charge this to the special occurrences so what have you done so either my alpha alpha does not change or if it changes then i can charge it to the decrement operation of k guys so this is how you formally prove uh, this okay so hence the total number of times alpha increases is at most l and if you have a bound on L, that will imply that uh, alpha is less than equal to M over uh, K plus one, or maybe plus one something, right? Uh, but this is what we were interested in, right? So if you look back, look back, this is what we were interested in upper bound, right? So this is also one way of showing this by a charging argument to the decrement operation. Okay, so... Okay. Yes. 
can i uh, try a slightly different argument you may still need all the formalism but this might give an intuition okay so you can think of the whole algorithm as picking groups of k elements right it lets the counter number of values in the counter once it becomes k it removes the k guys out okay yes and you keep doing this so because the remaining things survive and so you are collecting groups of k elements like the majority was collecting pairs this was collecting groups of k elements each finally some numbers survive in the counter with some frequency yes which is the fi hat okay yes so now i want to tell i pick an element in the counter surviving and i want to know what can it be the real frequency okay so its current frequency in the counter is fi hat and all i can say is that this element can appear at most once in each of the other groups because these groups are k distinct elements yes so if i ha if i is at most if i had plus m over k that's all true so th this is um i tried to do that proof uh, and it ended up doing this uh, so this is why you i may need, you may need all this for formalism I exactly think, but so I if you yeah so this is why i was trying to give uh, this intuition that why this algorithm is correct is that this is what i was trying to give that if you pick up k distinct elements from the array then heavy hitters remains and heavy hitters say correct so you are picking k elements k elements k elements k exactly. distinct elements finally yes. some number survive yes. and what, for that surviving number what can it be real frequency whatever its current frequency plus one each in each of the group which is at most that's m over k that's all yeah yeah so i mean yeah the, that so uh, i mean yes this is all that we need to say but if you try to make it a formalize it, formalize it it just like end up having uh, these things this is why i also gave the intuition what is happening the l the l is exactly the number of groups in some sense yes because Every time l you yeah group yeah this is a special event because you have decremented it means you have picked up k guys and uh, right. removed it so this special event is exactly equal to uh, the number of times we made group group okay okay so hopefully uh, you are convinced that this algorithm is correct but as i said before it 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 has false negatives okay uh so deterministic to randomized sketches okay so we cannot improve order k space if one wants additive error of at most m by k uh nice to nice to have a deterministic algorithm that is near optimal uh because and now then why should we look for a randomized solution because it allows look back if you look at a mr grise algorithm it doesn't allow deletion right i mean if we had like number coming 3 and then i say okay now delete 3 Four, delete four. Okay, then, then if I wanted to find a heavy hitters, it doesn't allow. So, and we will also see additional application of sketch-based solution. And for that, there are two kinds of algorithm, which is one thing. Something is called count min, and that is called count sketch. So we will see these two things in the next lecture. And the idea is again, uh, so basic idea is or basic hashing or sampling idea is. is that suppose we want to bk be the k heavy hitter so we will pick a hash functions from 1 to n to some ck like some order k buckets okay and the intuition is that if there are only k heavy hitters this hash function will distribute them uniformly in the sense that no bucket contains no bucket contains more than one heavy hitter okay okay and now suppose in this ideal situation nobody contains more than one heavy hitter then in each of them we can run uh, mr grise 
or majority element right because this is the most frequent element which has gone here so i can just run uh, in each of them this bucket find the most heaviest element among them okay so this is the whole idea of uh, this bucketing trick or sampling idea is that you pick up a hash function which is just larger than the domain and hoping that all the heavy hitters has gone to different buckets and in each bucket we will run a majority element and pick these guys out okay so this is what we will do uh, next time okay and that's all that i need uh, i wanted to say today okay so we will meet on wednesday and we will do uh, uh, this these two min count min and count sketches and learn how to do uh, heavy hitters in uh, even when elements are uh, deleted or or, or no okay any more questions because then we are done for the day